AutoLine Spotlight is presented by Ally. Do it right. On this episode, used car industry, boom or bubble. On today's show, we're going to be talking about the used car market. There's so much going on there, and normally we focus on the news side, but you ought to see what's going on there. And we've got three experts to talk about it today, including Mike Kane. He's the vice president of dealer financial services at Ally. George Glassman is the principal with the Glassman Automotive Group, which sells Subaru, Kia, and Genesis. And Steve Finley is the senior editor at Ward's Auto. And great having the three of you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start right out with you, Mike. Uh, the used car market, red hot. Nobody th saw this coming, I don't think, uh, based on the people I've talked to. But some are saying maybe this is just a bubble. How do you see it? Sure. Well, I think it's a, um, less of a bubble and more of a natural part of the cycle. Right. If you think about where, where we've come from over the last, say, eight years, right? We bottomed out 2009, 2010. You know, new car SAR dropped into the 10, just under the 10 range from a retail perspective. We weren't manufacturing used cars yet, right? And then all of a sudden we go through this five, six year upswing of new car sales and distribution. We all followed the SAR all the way up. Well, with all those sales comes used car manufacturing. We've created used cars at this point, right? So the natural offset of the cycle is now that all these new vehicles are getting ready to do their first turn or their second turn or coming off lease, they go into the market as supply or inventory. You know, and, and I think from an industry perspective, we've been watching it, we've been preparing for it, we're not surprised by it happening. You know, and now it's just a matter of how do we handle you know, effectively that supply as it comes back in and I think we've got a couple of good things, you know, tailwinds, if you will, you know, on our side. One is um, the OEMs have gotten pretty sharp at, at supply management from their side, right? They're watching the demand side. They're starting to craft supply now of the new vehicles back into the market. Two, we've got uh, technology that has come into play, which has made it really, really um, easier, I guess I'll say, than in the past to understand the used car supply coming back off and figure out where to distribute it to where the demand is. So I, I think it's less of a bubble, uh, and I think it's more of kind of a natural wave in the cycle that's out there. And, well, and on, on the managing uh, the, the supply, you and I were talking uh, the other day about mm -hmm. inventory management and how you have become a disciple of that. Can you talk about why you have and what you do to make that happen? Well, the, the market, again, is incredibly robust, and with, especially in the Detroit market, with leasing being as prevalent as it is, there are so many cars that are coming off lease that it really provides for us a tremendous opportunity. So it gives us a, a chance to, to get really excellent cars coming off lease where we, in many cases, know uh, whether they were one-owner vehicles, two-owner vehicles, the service history on it, and, um, and it really creates a great opportunity for, um, for any dealer to acquire all makes and models. And, and that's been the biggest uh, source of, of vehicles for us anyways to go ahead and, and uh, get out into the marketplace. And the inventory management is software which tells you market the, value yeah, information the, so you know how to price them, you know how many are out there in your market, and so it's, it's a lot easier to manage than it, uh, it is if you were depending on the gut instinct of the used car manager. Yeah, the technology component lets you know how many of that vehicle are within 100 miles for sale, so you know whether or not, you know, how to price them, uh, how to recondition them, uh, so that you're not competing against the other 100 cars, or if you are, you're priced in the, in the right way. So it's, uh, it's been a tremendous uh, uh, advantage to having that. Mike, George mentions that here in the Detroit area, the very high lease rate. How do you see it in the rest of the country? Well, I think it varies. I mean, lease rates are, are I would say, uh, extremely high, if not one of the highest penetration rates here in the Detroit market. Is that because of all the car companies here and the like, and everybody's getting a company car kind of a thing? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's historical in the marketplace. It's cultural based upon the demographics that are out there. Um, and it, it's also regulatory, right? There's some, some barriers in certain markets and states that don't make it as attractive. For instance, Texas. Texas is nowhere near you know, the same size and scale of a lease market as, say, you know, Detroit, Michigan, and maybe parts of the Northeast. 
So does that make it harder for the lower lease rates uh, areas to be able to get good used cars? No, not really. In fact, as George was saying, right, the, the inventory management capabilities at a micro level at a particular dealership or within a 100-mile radius of his market also apply to us on a macro scale. So I can look at inventory management across the U.S., and we can look at where, where vehicles are either grounding or where used vehicles are. And with technology today, we can move them anywhere we need around the country to where the demand is for distribution. So instead of having a bottleneck, somewhere, right, in a market, you know, if George doesn't need vehicles in his marketplace, that's not a problem. We can move them to the markets that need them pretty quickly and efficiently. And the technology is permitting dealers, ourselves included, we buy cars all over the country, and it's much easier than it ever has been because we have the data on it, we've got pictures on it, uh, we, we've got anything that we need. So cell phones and the internet have made it a whole lot easier to buy a used car because you know what you're buying or have a better idea. Absolutely, and again, uh, the technology is just incredible with the, the right. photos and with the additional information. You can see how that car was serviced in many instances, and so uh, it takes a lot of the fear out of it. I think the term is representation, so I, I think that's right, isn't it? So that you know the car really is what the seller is representing it to be. Yeah, and, and I think there are some guarantees, uh, I know, with Ally in terms of what we're buying and, and the guarantees that are provided. And uh, What do you mean guarantees? Well, you might be better able to speak sure. to it, but if we buy a car and it shows up with a certain degree of damage that we didn't feel was disclosed properly, Ally will step in, and I believe a number of the OEMs will, and ensure that everything is taken care of so that you know, both the seller and the buyer are going to be happy with the transaction. Well, and usually the seller um, is held to account, is, aren't they? I mean, you can only do that so many times, misrepresent a car before somebody's saying, hey, you're not playing the game right. No, nope, that's right. And, and so at Ally, uh, Smart Auction is one, of, one of our premier franchises, and it, it's really one of the nation's oldest and, and longest online automobile auctions, right? And it's a very large auction. You know, and, and so it's a market maker, right? And when you put together markets, buyers and sellers, the intermediary, which is the auction, smart auction, has to make sure that both parties are, are happy with the process. And so the consigner, who might be listing the car, you know, represents the vehicle in a certain condition. Um, the, the auction itself, we go in, we double check it, we inspect it, the pictures, the quality of, of understanding what that collateral looks like so that so maybe George as the buyer can get a good comfort level with it, right, entices him to make the purchase. And then as that intermediary, and, and this is one of the benefits, you know, the, the features, if you will, of our smart auction product is we warranty that. And so we'll represent to the buyer, hey, we're going to make it good for you. And we'll go back and we'll work with the consigner to see if it was an error or an omission or if it's a habitual. If it's habitual, those consigners will be eliminated from, from the auction. So we always make sure that and as the market maker, we're putting together you know, good consigners with good buyers and there's a trust factor there. And that really overcame all the uh, potential impediments or fears when online auctioning took off. People were saying, well, I'm, I'm, nobody's gonna buy a car they can't see. But if you do the things that you just said, they will buy the car. Absolutely. Confidently. Two years ago, Merrill Lynch came out with a prediction for the new car market that was very uh, dire. And because of all the cars that are coming off lease, I think this year there's, what, three and a half million vehicles coming off lease. And they said, oh, my gosh, uh, that's going to hurt new car sales because people will be attracted to these and it's going to drag <laughs> sales down and hurt residual values. None of that has happened. Why? <laughs> It's just a robust economy. I mean, I don't know if there's any other way to put it. Um, there are some people that will only buy a new car. And having said that, um, the attractiveness of, of lower payments with, uh, you know, the, the used cars. Also, um, the certification factor has in many ways helped that entire process out, where there's a much more comfortable um, feeling in able to, to get that right product and get it to the consumer where they're comfortable. So, um, like I said, the, all the stars have aligned, I think, in the, in the right way to, to make it a, a robust market. Yeah. Could part of the reason, too, be there's a lot more crossovers and SUVs coming off lease now? And that's what the market wants, not passenger cars. So maybe two years ago, it was more pass cars coming off lease, and now that is switched. Could that be part of the reason? To some degree, yes. But again, three years ago and two years ago, um, 
you know, there were still plenty of cars. And, uh, and again, the, the car business, selling cars, is not going to go away. So there's still a lot of passenger cars that are coming off lease. And again, those, that you know, presents a good market. Not everybody's looking for an SUV or CUV. There's no question that's the direction things are going. But um, like I said, it's just been a, a, an excellent market. But the ones that are looking for an SUV or CUV, to John's point, there's a lot more of them in the used car market, whereas there before. weren't before. So if you wanted one, you had to buy a new car. Now, my question to you guys is, um, at what point does the OEM's interest in a used car end? I mean, obviously, they, you know, if they're leasing the vehicle through, through their uh, financing unit, um, they have an interest in the remarketing of it. But second or third owner, fourth owner, do they care anymore? Or is there an indirect interest? I think they absolutely care. And again, the reason is um, if, if those cars are going to market and they're built well, which they are, and in many cases being certified, um, they get another opportunity to have that customer, which arguably could be a lost customer since it wasn't sold to that current customer as a new car. When that customer gets ready to get out of their uh, used car that they've purchased, they're going to be looking in many cases towards a new car or a newer car. And um, that brand loyalty, that's where the brand loyalty that's comes in. Point. So, you know, that would be my take on it. And, and I think um, whether you're a dealer or the OEM, it's always good business to take care of the customer and to keep a customer on board. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, whether the customer is a, is, is a used customer in your product or whether it's a new customer in your product, you'd kind of like to keep that customer in your, in fam your family of products. From a, uh, from a technical perspective, as a, as a lender, let's say, or as a lessor, you know, the OEMs also need to make sure that the, the, the demand for their used vehicles, particularly their, their off-lease vehicles, which are generally, you know, two to three years old, right, three years is an average, mm -hmm. uh, remains very high. You know, as the demand remains high and the value of those vehicles are stable, that makes it much more advantageous to lease the next new one, right? It sets, establishes the residual values. And so, it, you know, in the past, um, there have been practices that weren't so great. It was lease a vehicle and forget about it after it grounds. And as, as those values decline, right, maybe because there's not a lot of effort in remarketing and as the supply comes back, it drives the price down, it effect, eventually it hurts the OEM, it. right, on the front side because then the residuals for the next model year, the Stay next down. cycle is depressed, the payment goes up, and next thing you know, it, you've, you've got this problem. So I think it's in the best interest of the OEM, obviously, to look at it. Uh, there are a number of OEMs today that operate and have for a long time um, very effectively focused on that second and third turn. You know, they don't let that customer or the collateral get out of their hands. And, you know, George has probably seen a, a lot of it. Then there are some larger mass market OEMs that, you know, in the past maybe didn't pay attention to it as much. Today, I think everybody's watching it. It's interesting to me that there's so many more cars coming off lease and going into the used car market, and yet used car prices are going up. I know it varies. But can you guys explain to me why, with more inventory, prices are actually going up? It's, it's supply and demand in a lot of instances. And again, um, as, as we see new car prices slowly starting to increase, it's making the uh, difference between buying that used car and new car uh, far greater. A couple of years ago, with, with, um, uh, with very little inflation, uh, occurring in the new car marketplace, there was some uh, close, uh, the pricing was, was too close or, or very close, and in many instances people would say, ah, you know, I can get a new car for not much more. Now, as, the, um, as interest rates are rising and uh, the incentives, all of the manufacturers are trying to keep their incentives down, you're finding that the new car leasing is actually getting a little more expensive than it had been in prior years, and that gives the opportunity for those used cars to be uh, more robust into the secondary market. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking to a, a guy who used to work for Nissan and uh, now works for, uh, is Brian Finkelmeyer, in fact, uh, from um, the auto, and he was saying he thinks dealers should today look more at the car department, not the used car department and the new car department, but one car department. Does that make sense to you, or is there a natural distinction between the two in terms of the operation? 
you know, it, it's our business is evolving on a daily basis. And so, you know, it, it would be nice to say it's just cars. But the truth of the matter is that um, at least for us, uh, I think it's important that we manage the new car department in a in a different way. And and with uh, the advent of V Auto and other means of of really getting your arms around the the pricing and the marketing and what is in your current um, demographics, uh, like I had said earlier, if there's a hundred of a particular car or a thousand. So I, I think it's important to, to have some separation so that uh, you can focus on what you want because the new car, um, you know, marketing that new car is significantly different in, uh, in a lot of instances than, than marketing that used car. So again... Uh, I think he was also referring to maybe the silos that can be uh, built uh, when you have two different departments and they're sometimes competing against each other and not working in the best interest of the dealership ultimately. Uh, you see that happen sometimes if departments are trying to hit home runs off each other, especially if the service department is reconditioning a vehicle and, and charging the used car department a lot of money. <laughs> Even though all that money stays in the dealership, it's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a gamesmanship to it, as, as I'm sure you know. Everybody's got to work together. If you don't work together, then uh, it'd be pretty tough to get all the cars on the lot at the right pricing so that uh, consumers want to buy them. So, uh. Well, the w worst case scenario is when the used car department takes the car to be reconditioned down the street because it's cheaper <laughs> than at the dealership, and that has happened. Hey, I want to get onto a totally different topic right now. President Trump has talked about imposing import tariffs on cars. Uh, who knows if that's actually going to happen or not, but Mike, I'll start with you. It seems to me that would really help the used car market. I, I don't see where it would hurt the used car market. Because it would make new cars more <laughs> as, expensive. As the price of new cars go up, I mean, the consumers obviously want a, a the vehicle they desire, right? And if you can get a, a late model off lease, you know, CUV or, or something that today is very popular um, at a price point that puts the monthly payment very nicely for the consumer, I think we would see more demand and, and timing might be everything for us. You know, we, we talk about is there a bubble or is it a cycle? Um, sometimes you got to be a little lucky as well. I, from, from my perspective, a couple of things are different. Over the last call it four years, five years, which the lease market is what's driving these off-lease vehicles coming in, they've been very popular vehicles and, and they remain popular. So there's demand for them when they come off as used vehicles. Uh, if, if politically, if the, you know, the macroeconomic environment is potentially driving the price up of, of new vehicles, the demand is going to flow to used and, oh, by the way, those are exactly the same vehicles those consumers want. Right. And so with that, with that price point, what we see from a financing perspective is the gap between the price of a new vehicle, let's say low 500, 535, 540, and a used vehicle, high threes, 380, 390, that's kind of the market that's established out there from a, from a financing perspective. So to the extent that, that tariffs may drive that five closer to six, you're going to see an event that creates more demand, and then all of a sudden there won't be a used car bubble again, right? There'll be just a normal, you know, leveling, if you will, of 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 the supply demand, right? As these things are coming back into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Anything to add to that, George? Um, the prospects of uh, of what it would mean to uh, to the new car OEMs, uh, whatever the manufacturer is, it impacts the domestics as much as it does. Um, you know, the, uh, the foreign car manufacturers. So uh, it's a frightening proposition. I'm not really sure where it would all shake out. I'm not sure anybody really does. And, um, you know, ho hopefully it won't create a situation where uh, the prices, it goes into effect, the prices get so out of line that the new car uh, end of our business, you know, just freezes and, uh, and everybody goes towards used. Uh, that'll create yet another problem of sorts. Well, some economists have said if there are tariffs imposed, the 25% tariff, um, the domestics will nudge their price up. Of course. Uh, not as much as, uh, you know, the, the tariff, but get it up there. And then the used car uh, prices would go up uh, on the demand issue. So virtually all prices, <laughs> you know, new domestic, new uh, import or foreign and used cars would, would go up. Maybe at different levels, but still all go up. And the question then is, you know, where is the ouch factor for the consumer? Uh, at some point in time, the consumer is going to say, you know, maybe I'll just need to hold off a little bit longer <laughs> uh -oh. because it's too costly on the new car end. It's too costly on the used car end. Mm -hmm.
George, I want to bring up a topic that you've raised before, used car leasing. You've been a big proponent of that. Have you been able to move the needle on it? At all? I'm, I'm, I'm still disappointed. I would love nothing more than to see a, a, um, an aggressive marketing campaign by, um, by all the OEMs on their off-lease vehicles. I don't think there's any question that that is a, a tremendous opportunity that is not being taken advantage of at all. It just isn't. Uh, when we spoke a year ago, I thought that, that was going to be something that would really, as you said, move the needle. Mm -hmm. And I still believe it would move the needle. Um, just need to have uh, the OEMs say, okay, we're going to give it a legitimate try and get those cars on the road as a release for another three or four years. Again, the quality is there, and that gives the consumers an opportunity to, again, keep their, their uh, payment down. And I think it would just add to fuel to the fire of getting those, um, those cars uh, sold in a faster manner and getting them to the consumer in a, in a uh, much quicker fashion. What about it, Mike? What's your take on that? Uh, you know, we're, we, um, we're, we're cautiously bullish on it. I mean, I mean, George knows, you know, a number of years ago, we came out with a used car lease product. And so, you know, in advance of what we knew to be the, the right. kind of the flow forward, um, and it has been tough. It has, has been difficult to, to get it operationally rooted. And, and I think George is right. Unless there's, unless there's more than one lender pushing the process, it's difficult to change the operating habits inside of a single dealership, let alone an industry of dealerships. And so um, to be able to advertise price points is one thing, but when that, when that consumer hits the front door, what's the conversation, right? And, and, and how do we take the process? Leasing is, is a little more difficult um, with a used vehicle from a lender's perspective um, for two reasons, really. One, because it, you've got to figure out exactly what the right starting point is. Every used vehicle is unique collateral. New vehicles are pretty much the same. We know what they are, starting point, right? Mm -hmm. You look at color, make, mile, blah, blah, blah. So figuring that out is a little more difficult, right? And then, and then you know, the easy part of a used vehicle lease is figuring out what the residual looks like, right? That, that's a lot easier. And it's exactly opposite in the new car equation. Could this move to subscription services maybe a step there? And, and you know, Cadillac, Porsche, uh, Volvo, and others have come out with these subscription services where your monthly payment covers not just the car payment, but all the insurance, all the maintenance, all you do is put fuel in it. But, you know, Volvo's even offering a one-year subscription service. So what do you do with the car when it comes back after a year? I gotta believe they haven't done it yet, but I gotta believe they're gonna offer a subscription service for that as a used car. Could this be a step in that direction? Well, right. there's, there's no question that's, that, I think the big money really is in the subscription services. Uh, and Why so? Uh, well, because it's something that you can count on as reoccurring revenue. And um, like I said, you, you've got, whether it be the XM radio, whether it's the, um, you know, the OnStar or some of those other, um, uh, you know, items that are being offered to the consumer. I mean, they're very attractive items that people want. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like I said, it would be, uh, I think it would be advantageous to uh, all the OEMs to do that. Yeah. Another question then, uh, we're seeing the OEMs look at getting into mobility services, or some of them. I'm looking at GM, which has got a car sharing program called Maven, for example. And now they're starting to populate that fleet with cars that are coming off auction. They couldn't sell them at auction, so boom, they're throwing them into these car sharing fleets. And I think the next step is to take uh, cars off lease, potentially, and put them in there. What do you guys think about that, Mike? Uh, I think I think it's great. I think it's the right thing to consider, right? We've, if you've got this this vehicle, the asset, if you will, and it's got value, I mean, let's look at all of the all of the creative avenues today that the industry and the market's going. But the, it'll be it'll be demand driven, right? There there are um, real real barriers, if you will, on a legal and and regulatory perspective, state by state by state, for how these things may work. But I think you know we keep plugging away at it, and one of these times it's it's going to hit. It's going to work. So I'm. You should note that with a subscription service where people are swapping cars, those are used cars essentially. You're not getting a new car every time you um, get your uh, car, your you know like SUV for the weekend and your sports car for whatever. Um, you're getting a used car, mm -hmm. um, and you know it just goes to show the value of you know some people want their own car, mm -hmm. uh, like George was saying. Others are more than willing to use somebody else's car, whether it's, you know, it's been a year or two before they get it or whether it's been a month or two. 
Yeah, George, your thoughts on well, these inter- mobility services and all? Well, there's, there's no question. There's there's such a change uh, occurring in uh, in our business uh, in every direction, but um, it it poses an interesting question as to whether or not a consumer who goes to work and has their car sitting in a parking lot for seven, eight hours would be willing to have that car go out into the marketplace to be used by somebody that's going shopping or to go uh, wherever they may need to go and uh, to the airport, what have you. And uh, I I don't know if I'd want that with the car that uh, I'm driving, but uh, for a number of people, it would be an opportunity to to actually make money while their car's sitting in a parking lot. If it's there all day, uh, why not do something with it? So uh, I I think the avenues are just uh, unlimited. Uh, No, I would agree with you. I'm not interested in sharing my car, (laughs) but there's going to be a lot of people. uh, No, (laughs) it's all going to come down to money. But look at Airbnb. (laughs) Who would be interested in, in, you know, in renting their house out? It's their house, and yet they're... It's all over the place. Look, with this, we're going to have to wrap it up. Fascinating discussion. Who knew used cars could be this interesting? (laughs) Mike Kane from Ally. George Glassman from the Glassman Automotive Group. Steve Finley from Ward's Auto. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for a very interesting conversation. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. At Ally, we look at every aspect of your dealership to help it shine. Not shiny enough? We'll literally shine up everything. Danny, take it to the lid. You got it, my man. Yeah.